Thank you. Thank you, Beth. And uh, and my my colleague also, Zhao Bellenhorf from the SCI. Um, and we are, the three of us are the Sustainable Environment Institute. And we have a special guest for you today. And we're very happy to actually have had Marta Segura here before. Uh, I won't say exactly a year ago, but um, it was in fact uh, for the um, a, a very special um, event on, on urban heat. And in that case, we looked at the problems of, of heat stroke and people being uh, uh, affected, their health affected, and of course, the death rate. Today, we'll be visiting that to some extent, um, but we're with a real focus on, on urban equity, that is on the uneven impacts of urban heat on urban populations when it comes to, uh, well, we'll see. That's exactly where we're going with this. So um, yeah. Uh, this is, in fact, part of a series for uh, the fall for the this starting today. Uh, we rescheduled uh, Marta Segura for today. On uh, so this is uh, September twenty eighth, October nineteenth. We'll have uh, authors of unequal exposure to heat waves in Los Angeles: impact of uneven green spaces. These are Caltech researchers that have done a lot of very valuable uh, work in providing the data that we all need in order to better understand this, this crisis. October 24th, 25th, and 26th is Climate Palooza at West LA College. And uh, we also have on November 14th, uh, Dina Jilla Whitaker, who will be actually presenting uh, her, her book at West LA College. Um, so this is uh, the series, and uh, we are very happy to be uh, kicking it off today with this very special visit, because we actually have had the the pleasure, I mentioned to you, of having had Marta here uh, all, well over a year ago. Um, so um, we that particular seminar is actually hosted on our website. It's August 18th, 2022. It was just called Heat, and you can see that there is a recording of that as well as a series of articles and reports, and you can find that on our website under Teaching Resources. So uh, today we want to raise awareness of extreme heat risk and solutions and the constituents and peers, which is a chief heat officer. There are maybe 10 uh, chief heat officers today that are uh, in cities like Athens and Greece and Sydney, Australia, but very importantly, in American cities like Phoenix and Miami and New York City. Uh, the Climate Equity LA is, in fact, the um, the organization for which Marta uh, works. Um, she This is a, a bit too much text for a slide, but it's important to see that she has quite an, an extensive track record in environmental health. She has a master's in public health, and uh, she can address, you know, from many disciplinary points of view, the problem of urban heat. Uh, so it's an, it's a real um, uh, it's a pleasure to have her, and it's it's wonderful to have someone who is that knowledgeable uh, from a variety of approaches, not just urban planning, tree cover, but also uh, public health impacts. Climate change turns up the background thermostat on what was already intense summer heat and kicks it up an extra notch. One study found that within 30 years, the heat island effect will raise city temperatures an additional 50% of whatever they experience from climate change. So if the city experiences two degrees of climate change warming, they can also expect an extra degree from urban heat. We are on the pathway to global warming of more than double 1.5 degree limit within Paris. Climate scientists warn that we are already perilously close to tipping points that could lead to cascading and irreversible climate impacts. So um, it, the attention uh, overdue, but it, uh, it really does underline the fact that as we become a more urban species, a larger percentage of human beings are actually exposed to this problem of the urban heat island. Um, in this case, this is uh, the New York City um, uh, chief heat officer, and I think Marta Segura has just come back from New York, so she might have had a, interesting conversations with her colleagues in other cities. Every city really has its unique challenges. In the case of New York, they also have to worry about floods. Um, and um, and it, it and what measures they take actually depend a whole lot on the populations most affected, particularly the unhoused. Um, the record streak that we witnessed in Phoenix this last year did go on for a, a month, 31 days every day above 110 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, that is a record even for Phoenix. And it did um, really present challenges for people working uh, out on um, trying to reach people in distress uh, with water, with uh, shelter, with cooling centers, and Marta will elaborate on that when we talk about what is LA doing in that correction, 
connection. So we are in Phoenix, Arizona, talking about the scorching heat. Now, it's not just here in Arizona, but we're outside of Valley Wise Hospital, where they're talking about an influx of patients suffering from all kinds of heat-related illnesses. We're talking about heat stroke. We're talking about heat exhaustion, as well as third degree burns. The heat wave in Arizona is on track to break the previous record of 18 straight days of temperature surpassing 110 degrees Fahrenheit in Phoenix. Extreme heat now kills more people in the United States than any other extreme weather. Some of those most at risk include people who work outdoors as well as unhoused people. All this comes as a UN climate change report found the Earth could pass a dangerous temperature threshold in the next decade that could make climate disasters so extreme we will not be able to adapt unless urgent action is taken to reduce carbon emissions. For more, we're joined by longtime climate reporter Jeff Goodell, whose new book is just out, titled The Heat Will Kill You First, Life and Death on a Scorched Planet. He says he decided to write it after he walked for 10 blocks in Phoenix on a 115 degree Fahrenheit day and nearly passed out, making him realize he'd radically underestimated the dangers of extreme heat. Heat is the primary driver for this uh, climate transformation that we're undergoing right now. It is, it is this invisible force that is changing our world. Uh, Jeff Goodell, you write, about what happens to our bodies as the heat rises above 107 degrees Fahrenheit. You say as the heat rises, <clears throat> the proteins unfold and the bonds that keep the structures together break. At the most fundamental level, your body unravels. Your insides melt and disintegrate. You're hemorrhaging everywhere. Um, and uh, that is, in fact, what he, uh, extreme uh, heat stroke uh, looks like at temperatures above 107 degrees. So Phoenix at 110 is quite significant. Um, there's also the dimension that is being looked at, particularly in cities like New York and Los Angeles, and the effect that extreme heat has on people's mental well-being. Um, and it doesn't have to be a person who's already challenged with mental illness. Uh, it's as it puts it here, it singes the mind, not just the body. Uh, increases in statistics show increases of violence, of um, uh, of suicide, of um, uh, uh, many uh, um, very destabilizing experiences. This happens for people who are otherwise might be doing quite well. So this is the the extent to which heat can really represent a, a major change uh, for even those of us who don't um, have already um, uh, changes, but you can see it complicates drug treatment. Um, it is in fact a stressor for all of its own. Urban heat islands affect human health and it affects energy consumption. Those two things alone are enough to drive worldwide interest. When we build an urban area, we're replacing the vegetated surface and also the soil surface with this impervious surface like the paving material and the building material. By doing this, we're basically warming the urban areas and this will generate a temperature difference. And that's what we call it the urban heat island. We find out that the urban heat island affected by several factors. The first factor will be the surrounding ecological context. And then will be the size of the city. We're talking about size, we can uh, we mean both the area of the city and also the population size of the city. And then there will be the shape of the city and also the developing patterns of the city. We use a variety of satellite data, both land surface temperature data from MODIS and also impervious surface data from the Landsat satellite. Impervious surface data is essentially tells us how much building material is on the land surface in order to study the urban heat island. The urban heat island is much larger if you convert a forested area into an urban area. And this is because the urban heat island is a relative measure. So, so urban areas and forests are much warmer than the surrounding landscape than they are in deserts, for example, because the surrounding landscape is already warm. I think the general public should be interested in urban heat islands because of the fact that it's where most of the people live. And in the next 50 years, we're going to see 80% of the global population living in cities. And the urban heat island matters for everything from health, 
like to asthma and, and heart conditions to how much heating and air conditioning you need to use to, uh, to cool or heat your living space. So um, people uh, in government who are trying to mitigate these extremes uh, have various approaches, but the most significant dimension or variable in all of these things is uh, income. Uh, and that is working class communities, communities that are in Los Angeles. We're talking about communities that are mostly people of color, that lack trees, that lack that cooling effect. And as you probably know, just from this last summer, the differences between a tree lined uh, boulevard or neighborhood on the west side of L.A., and what might be the experience downtown when it's 110 degrees might be as much as even 20 degrees difference. So uh, addressing the heat island effect and addressing the, the challenges it has for public health is um, really tailored to, uh, as we just saw, you know, what, what are the features of the city you live in? For example, in Los Angeles, we don't worry that much about humidity, but other cities that have, like Miami, that have high levels of heat might also really have high levels of humidity. And that's a completely unique challenge to public health experts as they approach that affected population. Uh, we will be uh, upcoming uh, sharing with you the work that's been done at Caltech uh, that actually measures for the city of Los Angeles, what are the, uh, the median household income and uh, as this correlates with uh, land surface temperatures. And you can see that there are spatial patterns for Los Angeles based on income and on uh, degrees Celsius. With the, uh, of course, the Antelope Valley, Lancaster, Palmdale, registering some of the highest temperatures, but not to be um, uh, left out, uh, our downtown area is also. And this has a lot to do with the ability of cities to absorb heat. Asphalt is dark, it absorbs heat. Rooftops of buildings are often tar papered, they absorb heat. Large parking lots with lots of automobiles reflect and absorb a lot of heat. All of that contributes to this phenomenon of the heat island. So in that way, um, we actually have to um, uh, find ways to um, address that through, for example, tree planting. Um, the EPA did put out a heat islands and equity report. All of these will be um, shared with all of you on our website. So these articles that I've been showing you will appear there as well as any kind of recent government reports. 